most of us, and I think we would both start off with, race isn't real, race is some stuff that we made up um, to try to get advantage over other groups. So this is something that's human. And I, you know, I would argue that it is rooted in sin. And I would define sin for us as our attempt to try to get good things most of the time by our own means when God has provided a way for us. And so when we are uh, trying to do things our way instead of actually following what God is trying to lead us to do, we often end up doing really bad things. Um, and one of the things that we have done, there are all kinds of isms that we can trace to sin. Um, but one of those isms is to try to separate and to try to gain advantage over one another by making up these racial and ethnic differences. So, you know, when we think about race, we could go back to the founding of modern anthropology and the Caucasoid and the Negroids and the Mongoloid peoples and Prince Boaz was a racist and all of that kind of stuff. Um, that's part of it. And then we could look at ethnicity as being culture. And so there are subgroups that fall under those racial categories that kind of uh, go along with that. You know, it was all made up for a purpose of people trying to gain social, political, economic advantage over people. And so at the root, it's selfishness. Um, and so when we are trying to assert our own sovereignty and our own independence from God, you know, a lot of that relates to other things that we talk about, like selfishness and greed and pride and arrogance and all of those other things that we think about as sort of being um, fundamentally sort of part of our fallen nature that Christ is trying to redeem us from. Um, in the context of thinking about things like racism and prejudice, you know, I think a lot of people are taught that, you know, racism sort of deals with institutional, structural sort of edifices that are there to try to uh, help to promote and preserve these hierarchies and prejudice is something that's a little bit more personal when you're harboring personal biases against each other. And the personal biases usually inform a lot of the structural edifices and the institutional practices and the rules that we create. But we also nowadays need to think about sort of the sort of uh, more unconscious and more subtle things, ways that these play out in real life. So um, in thinking about privilege, um, we are all advantaged and disadvantaged, but usually in different dimensions of our lives. So there are ways that we can be advantaged and there are ways that we can be disadvantaged. Um, and privilege can sometimes happen unconsciously. So even if you don't necessarily subscribe to the point of view that you know certain racial groups are better than others or certain racial groups have advantages than others, because these things have historical meaning. And in the context of the United States, they are legally inscribed. I mean, there have been court cases to decide, you know, are Chinese Americans like white or black? Do they have to go to segregated schools? Are Indian Americans black or white? There was this whole rule about whether or not Armenians were white or black. So it was the Supreme Court that decided that Kim Kardashian was white. Um, like, it, it, I mean, it, like I'm, I mean, I'm not kidding about this stuff. I she mean, has her own checkbox, Kardashian, right? But, like, there are, like, the, you know, these things that have legally happened. So even though they're made up, like, they're very real, and they can't go away that easily as a result of the fact that they've now got hundreds of years of history and law and practice. Like, there's, you know, the Office of Management and Budget and the Census, you know, has decided who falls into which category. These things are actually very, very real, and as a result of it, people have privileges. So even if you might not think of yourself as prejudiced, um, and even if you are, in fact, not prejudiced, there are sometimes certain advantages and disadvantages that you have because those titles, those boxes come with years of history and years of accumulations of wealth, accumulations of certain types of advantages, creations of networks that really do affect people's life chances. Um, it's a phenomenal response, and you, you captured so much of it. I think that the two things I would build on what you said, because I actually agree with all of that, except for the sin part, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, not, not because I don't agree that it's, it, it is incredibly sinful. Yeah. It's just it's a different conception so of the sin. Um, <laughs> uh, but just to, I think this, the issue of structures and the individual are so powerful, because I think oftentimes in our popular discourse around race and racism, it becomes brought down to the individual. What did that cop do? What did the student do? What did the store owner do? What did the thief do, right? And so the individual is obviously fundamentally important because we impact one another on a regular basis, on a daily basis. But this point that I really want to bring home about what Andre is saying about how the, the individual prejudices and manifestations of bias end up impacting policy and structural and systemic and endemic racism. So then we need to be actually able to talk about the school to prison pipeline. We need to be able to talk about, about unfair, uh, unequal sen sentencing when it comes to small drug crimes. We need to be able to talk about um, who gets access to reproductive health care. Right? These are all 
linked issues that then get embedded under a broader framework of racism that is far beyond the individual. The second point I want to bring home is this question about privilege. And we talk about it a lot on college campuses, right? It's a powerful framework to be able to understand. People are often very uncomfortable talking about privilege. Very uncomfortable, because nobody wants to feel bad. That's understandable. I'm not trying to make you go around feeling like dukes, right? That's a slang term, but we won't expand on it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's not the point of, of being able to ascertain or understand one's own privilege. The point of being able to unpack privilege, for example, I'll use my own body as an example. I am a cisgendered woman, meaning my sex and my gender match. They're not in conflict or anything for me, right? I am middle class currently. I'm highly educated. Um, I am straight. Um, I am fluent English speaker, right? I have tremendous access to privilege. And what's the fundamental base of privilege? I don't have to think about it. I don't have to think about what bathroom to use, or at certain times will I be safe or unsafe? At certain times, well, who will think what about me, et cetera, et cetera. On the flip side, this is the, the part about privilege, and this is the thing about domination and subordination living in one body. At the same time, I'm a woman, and I'm a woman of color, and I grew up low income, right? And I'm fairly young appearing. Uh, so shouldn't be laughing at that, people. <laughs> right? So do people discount what I have to say because of the nexus of these sets of identities. So privilege and subordination can live in one body. So the point is not to feel bad about it. The point is to be able to say, where do I get privilege simply by being born the way that I am? I don't have to think about it. I get the benefit of the doubt. I'm not paying a tax, right? A psychological, spiritual tax on certain parts of my identity. And then to go beyond that. 